Full Bloom is brought to you in part by the following. Welcome to Full Bloom, the award-winning show that celebrates life. Here's your host, Zeta Christian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Full Bloom. I'm Zeta Christian. In 2010, Aquila Polonica, a publisher that specializes in the Polish experience in World War II, published a book, a novel, titled Maps and Shadows. The story, lovingly and fiercely told by author Krysia Jopek, draws on the little-known chapter of the war, the brutal Soviet deportation of 1.5 million Polish civilians to forced labor camps in Siberia. Two of those 1.5 million people are with us tonight. I'm honored to introduce you to brother and sister, Henry Jopek and his sister, Helen Zasada. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being on the show tonight. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. So, Maps and Shadows, as I understand, because I have spoken with the author, uh, Krisha, is perhaps best called a fictional biography because so much of the story uh, is true. Now, I know uh, that the story opens in 1939, and I want to get a, a basic idea of what things were like then. So, Helen, how old were you, and what was your world like then? I was 15, and uh, getting ready to go to high school. I was a little la late because I was at <coughs> in grammar school longer because they were going to open high school in uh, in our town, so I don't I wouldn't have to board. So I was uh, <coughs> worth waiting for. But, the life was very peaceful, very, very pleasant. It was a rural area with uh, with farmers who were doing good farming, and actually, our this is called Osada, and our parents, uh, our fathers. Uh, there were 48 of them living on the Osada, where the volunteers of uh, 1920 war with Bolsheviks. Oh, and I see. So the, the, your father was a veteran <coughs> yes, of the Bolshevik father, War? Yes. Okay. And uh, so they were awarded a um, piece of land and started from nothing and actually came quite well, <coughs> did quite well. And, I was going to go to university because father had enough to educate us and we valued, he valued education. And it was actually very pleasant. It sounds very much like I would expect today. A young girl, 15, you know, living at home, you getting ready to go to a, a local high school so you don't have to go away to school, you have plans for college. You have girlfriends and you have yes. chores, I'm sure, to do. Just not, not, nothing that's out of the norm. Um, Henry, how old were you then in, in that period? This is before the Russian soldiers came. How old were you and how would you describe your life then? I was 12. I was born uh, February 19, so I, I was just, just over 12, maybe 12, uh, close to 12 and a half. Uh, uh, by the time, uh, by the time the war started, uh, the same as Helen said was uh, very pleasant, very peaceful. We had a farm, we had horses, we had uh, cows, we had pigs. Uh, we lived uh, uh, what you would consider a fairly well life, and uh, we even had a co co cooperative. Uh, in uh, which um, our father managed in our Osada, which is a village. And uh, everything uh, seemed to be all right. And suddenly... 
And I was just going to say the, the work that, broke yeah. out and everything went to pieces. Now I want you to, if, if you can, tell me about that night that the Russian soldiers came to the door. Uh, that wasn't until 1940, February, February 10, 1940, when the Russian uh, soldiers knocked at the door in the middle of the night, uh, not the middle of the night, maybe about two or three o'clock in, in the morning. But there had the, been times during that period where you thought they might come, wasn't uh, there? Well, we, um, we were always scared. Mm -hmm. We always had a, uh, the, the carriage ready to escape to the forest mm -hmm. because at that time the, we were afraid not so much of Russians but we were afraid of Ukrainians who were uh, when the Rus Russians came Germans they were practically uh, took over from uh, fr from uh, Russians and we were afraid that uh, we, uh, we, like so many others, uh, we, uh, they, they were ba basically cut, cut their throats up. Okay, so, yeah, so what a way to live. So, so you, you have this fear that goes, that you live with, I mean your children, you have this fear you live with for almost a year, but one night they do show up. And they they finally showed up. They knocked at the door. There was four or five of them. It was a bayonet drawn. They took my father. They uh, t tied him to the leg of the table uh, with a face to the wall. And they gave my mother 45 minutes to pack our belongings. And they uh, even suggested that uh, you may want to t pack some warm clothing because where you are going, there may be cold at that time. And um, in that packing, Helen, let me come to you for a minute. I remember reading in the book that the soldiers said to your mother to pack useful things. And she took a, a down quilt and some warm clothing, some dried meat, um, what what else do you remember that night uh, of packing? <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he he said to take food for six weeks and uh, and and clothes and whatever. F fortunately, people who came to arrest us were especially the Russian officer was very sympathetic and uh, uh, my mother panicked and she just was like disabled. She couldn't do anything. So he followed me and he says, take this, take this, take this. But sometimes when I looked at something and hesitated whether to take it or not, and he says, take it, take it. And um, um, because once I said we had some uh, grain, uh, I guess it was wheat or, or something else, but and I tried to figure it out how much I should take for six weeks, and he said, "Pour everything." Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's good that in a, such a horrible situation. But as you said, at least. He was a, a more sympathetic person and, because uh, this man was definitely m more sympathetic than than the other soldiers had nothing to do. He was just he, they were just standing and, and watching, so nobody will escape, or my father will not try to escape. And uh, <clears throat> there is one thing that hit me very deeply uh, when we kind of finished packing and time was running out, they were rushing us, get ready, get ready, get ready. And I came to our bedroom and there was a, a picture of the uh, heart of Jesus. And I knelt by that picture and said short prayer. And he was standing there and he said, if you want to take it, take it. In Russia people are praying also. I said, how? Oh. It was a big picture with the, with the glass, covered with the glass. I said, it will break. And I didn't take it. It, it was impossible to take it. There was no, no thing. But uh, whenever I tell that story, 
people always say that I am that I want, I am too kind for for Russians. Well, people are people, and they have hearts, and some of them did show sympathy and like that officer because when they came to us they came little later little later than to other houses and uh, they went he went first to arrest another person and her husband was already gone probably in prison he was an officer and uh, i don't know if her son was at home or not she was a brave woman, grabbed uh, acid, but um, not uh, some kind of liquid and drunk, and she wanted to poison herself. Oh my gosh! He, it made it, it made him very nervous, and when he came to us, he was like not sure of himself. I mean, he he had a heart, but that was about all. I mean. We, he was guiding us to, to say to take everything that is edible because we have things hidden in different places. Oh. So sometimes I hesitated. Should I dig in the snow in this place because I knew where it was? And uh, But then I, I decided and I, I, I think I packed the most. Do you remember if there was anything in particular that you wanted to bring that you had to leave behind, other than obviously the picture, the picture of Jesus. Is yes. that the one? I think it's my, my grandmother had one that was a, a, a picture, and it was Jesus holding the heart like yes. this. Yes, well, Yeah, my grandmother had that. And um, so, but, well, Henry, let me ask you, that night when, every, when things are being packed, was there anything that you thought, I would love to take this, but I know I can't? I really wasn't uh, participating very much in whatever was going on. I was uh, mm -hmm. basically scared what was going to happen, whether they're going to shoot my father, and uh, mm -hmm. that, that type of a thing. I uh, really was not uh, overly concerned of what we are taking, what we are not taking. Okay, it's just but, a matter of let's just, stay alive. Just a matter. But uh, uh, when Helen was referring to the kindness, uh, the, the, that officer took the father's head and hanged it on a <laughs> on a sled, a sled out there. He said, "Take this. You, you, you. Uh -huh. In Russia, you, you, you're going to look like a gentleman, like uh -huh. a." <laughs> and we took it. And later on, we exchanged it for something in Russia, <laughs> and uh, brought maybe a, a pound of flour for for that hat oh that he hanged on the uh, sled. Oh my. Um, Henry, what is the significance in the book about the address 44 Barber Street, Windsor, Connecticut? What is the significance of that? Uh, when we finally, uh, when we finally arrived in Siberia, my father made sure that was our mantra that we were supposed to remember. And my father was an optimist. I didn't, uh, didn't. Uh, really think that we'll ever get out of Russia, but my father was always an optimist. He said, if any one of us will come out alive, re remember this address, 44 Barber Street, Wilson Khan. It was Wilson, not Windsor. Oh. Uh, but uh, Wilson is a part of Windsor right now. Oh, it I was see. So we remember that like the soldier in the army remembers her, uh, his ID or the rifle number or something like that. If you are woken up at night, you, you, you know 44 Barber Street, Wilson, gone. And, and what was at that address? Uh, my uncle, who emigrated to the United States uh, probably 90, somewhere between 1909 and 1912, lived at that address. And my father said that if you ever get out, go there and he will take care of you. So you had family. You knew that that address would be a uh, safe very place. Very valuable, yeah. Oh, so you did mention Siberia. And in the book, 
uh, your family is taken to a, a slave labor camp in Siberia. Now, when I think of the word Siberia, and I think when most people think of that, we think of images of, of a lot of snow and things very cold and, and isolation. Is that the way it was when, when you got there? Helen? Yes, it Did, was. Okay. It was snow. Was, uh, it, there was an awful lot of snow, and, uh, and somehow people managed to live through the winter. Winter started in October and ended in May. And uh, people had to go to work, and be, like our father was uh, cutting timber cutting trees in the forest. They had to walk some t quite a distance because in the first place we were in a special, it was a kolkhoz. So kolkhoz was a farmland and, and outside of the kolkhoz were fo was big heavy forest when they were cutting the trees. They, get, they were getting up very early and trudged through that snow and worked all day long mm -hmm. and after that they came back and and did you have to use the food that you brought absolutely. with you absolutely was, was that supplemented with anything else or was well um, person who was working was getting uh depends how how much he produced uh, a certain amount of bread usually half a pound of dark bread and uh, I guess they were giving a little bit for children uh, and uh, there was a store but it was always empty and you uh -huh. very seldom could find anything in it, could buy anything in it. You couldn't buy bread, you couldn't buy sugar, you couldn't buy there, there was nothing that people, local people were saying, when river starts going, uh, in other words, when... Uh, when the ice melts? Uh, the, the, when ice it. will melt, the, everything will come. Oh. Nothing ever came. Oh. And, and they oh. knew it, because the people in that place where we were, when we came first in Russia, were the Polish people from actually those were very wealthy people from western part of Russia, eastern part of Poland. And that 1920 war was about that border. And the people said that they were, uh, Russians were first, or Pol Polish were, just, and they were just changing hands. And they were praying that Polish will stay. Unfortunately, they didn't because later on, the border somehow was, uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly how it was established, but those people found themselves, and it was pure Polish uh, country. Well, Helen, let me, um, I, I want to switch gears just for a minute, because I'm, I'm getting the, the time cue that, um, uh -huh. and there are a couple questions I want to be sure we get to. Um, I, I understand that when the family was there for a while, so it's your, the, the, the mother, the father, three children. You yes. are two of the three children. Yes. And at some point, you are broken up. The family is dispersed. And Helen, where did you go? Where were you sent? Uh, well, um, that was after amnesty. When, Hitler, uh, when Germany attacked Russia, the Russian decided that the people who are in prison in, po uh, in Russia, Polish people, can be good uh, soldiers. And after amnesty, they gave us freedom. We could move. We could go south. We could go. We could, we could uh -huh. travel before we couldn't. So at that time, my, uh, when uh, after amnesty, my father joined the uh, left the place where we were living and went south when the Polish army was being created. So that put an awful strain on my mother. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, he sent us a telegram and said that pack and, and leave uh, <clears throat> Poshowek right away beca before river freezes. So, because, 
So, so you you left and then the father was first, and then mother and three of us. And some of you, I understand, uh, you uh, wound up in Africa of and, all but places. But then it was when we were in Afghanistan. Um, Uzbekistan. Pakistan. In Uzbekistan, yeah. and then uh, Uzbekistan, Africa. Then that's where we were started being separated because a mother gave him to cadets. It was young. Uh, young soldiers, but young soldiers. They um, knew that uh, they wanted to take as many children out of Russia as possible, so they created an orphanage and cadets and eunuchs, oh. young soldiers. So mother, just to save him, brought him to uh, cadets. She didn't give my younger brother. She could have. People were leaving children in orphanage just to save them. Oh, gosh. And, gosh. well, I was staying with her, but at, for the time being, I was lost because I lost the train. And oh. I was separated from my family. Oh, my gosh. My mother had a very difficult time. That, that had to have been, I mean, I, I can't, I, I simply can't imagine what that was like. But in, we don't have a, a lot of time left, yeah. and I just want to, um, a, a, a couple of things. Henry, you are wearing on on your jacket lapel there. Uh, what I understand is the Siberian Cross. Yes, it and is. What is it? And what is it for? And how did you receive it? Uh, well, that was uh, ba basically we we didn't have to do anything. Just uh, just basically surviving Siberia. Well, that's <laughs> that, big. That, that's that was a, big. Uh, uh, that's why they give a cross, and the cross was given to us by the Polish. Uh, uh, president who is now uh, who is uh, dead, who is died deceased, who crash. died on a trip to uh, Smolensk in Russia to uh, celebrate or commemorate 70th anniversary of the Cutting Forest Massacre where Russians uh, shot uh, 22,000 of Polish officers and oh Polish my. intellectuals, and oh uh, they, we, they were going out there to uh, to celebrate this, mm -hmm. and they were added to the. Not, not celebrate the, the, the or to or honor, yeah, uh, to uh, memorialize. To memorialize. Yes. memorialize. Yes, and uh, and I understand he signed. You you have the little book that we have up here. He signed that, and from what I understand from uh, your daughter, who is the author of the book Maps and Shadows, she mentioned that that the president was to sign, what, 80 or so, and, and, and wound up only signing a few, but one of them was yours. Uh, the, he, all, he only signed about seven out of the 80 crosses mm -hmm. that were supposed to be awarded, and they were awarded in New Jersey at the uh, 70th anniversary okay. of our deportation to Siberia. I, I want to, uh, just to mention for anyone who is in the audience right now, if you're just joining us. Um, I am talking with Helen Zasada and Henry Jopek. They are two of the people who are featured in the fictional biography called Maps and Shadows by Trisha, uh, Krisha Jopek. And uh, the, there is something in the book that is uh, that, that has been fictionalized, uh, just very, very minor things. I believe in the book, uh, Krisha had um, you carrying a dictionary that uh, in that one of the things that you packed when you, when you left. Uh, and I understand why she did that. She is such a poet. And I'm going to talk with her on, on another show. But I, I am trying to get a handle on this very large picture, this huge experience, and bringing it down. And after, when, when things finally are uh, at a point where the family is reunited, and I understand there's a lot of trauma and everything in between, but who in the family is eager to talk about the experiences, and who is reluctant to say anything, uh, even if that if that definition applies? What, well, for each of you, Henry, were you? Were you eager to talk about what happened with people, or were you silent? No, I was not afraid. I was always ready to tell the whole story, and I was uh, 
I was not the type to, to keep silent. Why, why do you think the story is important to be told? The story because there are so many people that do not know what happened to those out of the 1.5 million people. That, the, the, there's only 140,000 people that General Anders, who was our commander in Russia, managed to smuggle, practically smuggle to Persia, and from then on out, we spread over the uh, Helen went to Africa, I, I went to Middle East, my father went to Italy, but uh, the, there was more than a million people that are still unaccounted for from uh, all the people that were deported. Oh, Henry. And, and, and Helen, when everybody gets together, is, is this a subject that, that you are eager to talk about, or are you more quiet? Oh, no, when we got together, that's, that's fine. Uh, yeah. We were happy. Uh, when the uh, war ended and, uh, and uh, um, civilian camps, like our at, at, uh, camp in uh, mm -hmm. Tengeru in Africa, were being liquidated. People who had somebody in Polish army, brothers, uh, sister, father, could go to England. People who didn't have anybody had to go either return to Poland or if they were healthy, they could go to uh, Brazil, Ost uh, Australia, New Zealand, but they had to be perfectly healthy, and not many of them were. I had imagine. I imagine too that the 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 whole there had to be a, a lot of trauma, just physical trauma, from the the wear on the body from going up from a place like Siberia, and then coming to a um, to Africa, coming to a desert. I mean, the what that had to have done, the toll uh, that had to have taken. You know. You know Actually, there was, there was no trauma. You were just doing what you were told, going where you, went, where you were told to go. And we were practically deprived of our freedom and everything, but everybody tried desperately to get on that uh, train that was going to... Uh, what, um, Krasnovodsk and, and the, later on to Persia. I, I think when I, when I read the book, I kept thinking um, resilience, that, that it had to have been such, such resilience, I mean, in order to survive. Uh, yes, it has been. And uh, it, it, it's amazing what people can go, how people cling to life yes. when it's threatened. And, I hope no if one ever has to go. If we were two weeks longer in Russia, mm -hmm. we would, we would starve. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Well, there was divine providence operating there on some level. Yes. Um, I want to. Um, I, I'm getting the signal. Unfortunately, that we are out of time, and I want to thank you both very much for coming. Your stories are conveyed. Henry and Helen's stories are conveyed in the book Maps and Shadows by Krisha Jopek, which is published by. Aquila Polonica, a publisher specializing in the Polish experience of World War II. You can see this interview, and you'll be able to see my interview with Krisha if you go to youtube.com and you can search Zeta Christian Full Bloom and search the last name Jopek, J O P E K, for this interview. And uh, I, I invite you, please do so. This is an important story, it needs to be told. Thanks very, very much for coming tonight and sharing this story. Uh, let me also thank my, my FB crew and uh, especially Jessica Batchelor, who is filling in for us tonight. Jessica, thanks very much. Thank you, too, in the audience. I say this every week, and I mean it sincerely. I do know the value of time, and I appreciate that once again you chose to share an evening with me. Thank you. Full Bloom is brought to you in part by the following.